Hello, my name's Gavin Plumley, and I'm a cultural historian. Isolation's a strange thing. Just at the moment we should have been gathering for a music festival, we're being told to stick much closer to home. Currently, I'm enjoying these beautiful apple orchards around the village where I live. Some of us will be glad of the quiet. Others will be longing for the day we can explore further afield. But I think all of us will be missing one thing in particular, the opportunity to hear Marla's music live. Personally, I was hugely looking forward to coming to Colorado to do just that. I was going to be speaking about the composer's place within a wider world of culture, with his links to other artistic movements, other thinkers, other figures within that constellation of brilliance that was Vienna, at the turn of the last century. There was such a spirit of collaboration and of shared ideas in the Austrian capital around 1900. How different then from our world in 2020, typified as it is by seclusion. But I realise that out-of-the-way quality is for all the enormity of Mahler's symphonies at the very core of his being too. It is also at the centre of how his symphonies and songs came into being. I've been lucky enough to visit all three of Mahler's composing huts, where every summer he would spend hours, days, weeks on end, alone, in isolation, socially distanced, writing his music. The pattern began on the Attersee, not far from Salzburg, in a relatively well-built hut in the grounds of a hotel right on the banks of the lake. There he was able to compose the second symphony we should all have been hearing in this year's festival, as well as the third symphony that came in its wake. They are both enormous works, in length, in scope, in the resources they require, but both were written in a room just big enough to contain a small grand piano, a chair and a tiny desk. When Mahler became wealthier thanks to his jobs in Hamburg and then in Vienna, he was able to acquire a summer villa of his own. It was in Mayanig, on the banks of the Vertice in Carinthia. As well as the ornate Arnouveau villa on the lake, Mahler had ordered the construction of a new hut. It was tucked in the woods above the house, and was to become a truly inspired place, where he would go on to write his fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth symphonies, as well as the Rucket leader and the Kinder Torten leader. Flashes of inspiration were frequent occurrences. Sadly, it was also a place that would be struck by tragedy, when Marla's daughter died in 1907, forcing the family to find another summer home. But again, the pattern was repeated. Moving to Toblach, high in the mountains and now in the northernmost part of Italy, Marla had another hut built. Smaller, flimsier than the others, but no less inspired and inspirational. It was to give birth to Das Lied von der Erde and the Ninth and Incomplete Tenth Symphonies. What Mahler's huts have made me realise, standing inside them and seeing them within the landscape, was that he was able to conceive enormous things in tiny spaces. His particular brand of symphony, which he told Sibelius had to embrace everything, was conceived in the area of a small bathroom or kitchen. The huts, all three of them, are calls to creativity, reminders that even in isolation we can also be inspired. We can endeavour to speak great things, and when the current appalling situation has revealed even more disturbing things about the imbalanced societies in which we live, to speak truth to power. To my mind, Mahler's symphonies aren't bereft of their place in the concert hall, though that is exactly where they should be heard, because they also have a happy place within our isolated homes. When we listen to them, alone, the works remind us of the vistas we cannot currently see. They remind us of the great struggle in life between forces of positivity and forces of negativity. They remind us of the things and the people we miss, 
They remind us that regardless of faith, there is hopefully a higher purpose. And they remind us in our isolation of words that Marla himself decided to set to music. While he was living in Mayanig and composing in the second of his huts, Mahler chose to respond to a number of poems by Friedrich Ruckert. A somewhat under-celebrated poet, Ruckert nonetheless provided Mahler with exactly what he needed, including the words Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. This song is often performed as the last of the five Ruckert lieder, and it was composed on the 16th of August 1901, not long before Mahler formally met and then married Alma Schindler. The poem is perfect. It tells us how, in isolation, the narrator has found peace and a true understanding of his or her place in the world. But more than that, it speaks of the consolation we can all find in thoughts of the beyond, in those we love, and most importantly, in the music we cherish, especially Mahler's. This is an English translation by my friend and colleague, Richard Stokes. I am lost to the world with which I used to waste much time. It has for so long known nothing of me, it may well believe that I am dead. Nor am I at all concerned if it should think that I am dead, nor can I deny it, for truly I am dead to the world. I am dead to the world's tumult and rest in a quiet realm. I live alone in my heaven, in my love, in my song. Relish this period of isolation, relish its quiet, but also relish what Mahler tells us when we turn away from the world outside and truly listen. <laughs> 